Hi everyone, and welcome to Neurophototherapy, Sonia Bui and Jennifer Gilbert in conversation. My name's Colin Hambrook. I'm editor of Disability Arts Online. I'm an older white man with short spiky hair, wearing glasses and a green t-shirt whilst I'm sitting in my home office. First of all, let me say happy Autistic Pride Day and what better way to celebrate them with this fascinating discussion between autistic artist Sonia Bui and Jennifer Gilbert about neurophototherapy, Sonia's project exploring the use of photography and collage to recover from a lifetime of identification with the wrong neurological type. Get your questions in for Sonia and Jennifer to respond to during the live Q&A at the end of the event using the YouTube or Facebook comments sections. Do join us for our next event, which will be on Thursday the 8th of July at 3.30pm. We'll be celebrating the launch of Electric Bodies, a landmark text to honour and share the heritage of the disability arts movement. We'd really appreciate it if you could fill in a feedback form for today's event, which we'll provide a link to in the comments section later on. But for now, I'm delighted to hand over to Jennifer and Sonia for today's discussion. Hi everyone and welcome to our talk today hosted by Disability Arts Online. Um, my name's Jennifer Gilbert and I'm here today with Sonia Bui. We thought we'd start with a short little introduction to ourselves. So my name's Jennifer. I have long red hair with a thick red fringe. I am a white woman in my mid thirties with very pale skin and wearing a black top with a red necklace. And my role is I run the Jennifer Lauren Gallery, which works with disabled, self-taught and overlooked artists across the UK and overseas. And I'm also a freelance producer and curator working with disabled artists. Over to you, Sonia. Okay, so my name is Sonia Bue and I am a white middle-aged woman with short cropped hair, wearing a blue shirt and black rimmed glasses. I've also got red lipstick on today. Um, for the occasion. Um, <laughs> I'm a freelance artist and I'm also a writer and a consultant and I work in the area of neurodiversity and um, I also work in the area of post memory which we might touch on later but maybe not very much. Perfect. So today we're here to chat about your Arts Council England funded project called Neurophototherapy which is a creative practice-based self-recovery tool for late diagnosed autistic women and marginalized genders. It is a fact that women are more likely to receive a late diagnosis of autism and that there is a serious lack of aftercare following this diagnosis in adulthood. So after spending many days and hours <laughs> delving into everything you've done for this project, Sonia, and since you started it in February this year, um, that through you reviewing your own life story from very early life onwards and in the many creative ways that you've explored this, it's being a very powerful healing tool and a healing process for you. It seems it's allowed you to be more accepting of things that might have happened throughout your life and to be able to recognise more easily now other things that need to be in place for you to be able to take part in an equal way. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I thought we'd briefly start um, and touch on when you were formally diagnosed and how this made you feel. Okay, so my formal diagnosis came in March of 2016 and it, it followed a period of, um, uh, a long period of time of um, sort of supporting family members um, with the same diagnosis and uh, really doing a lot of research into autism and sort of a gradual understanding of myself as an autistic person um, and it was very tentative to begin with and I had no clue for many years that that I was autistic <laughs> I thought I was a neurotypical person <laughs> um, and even right up to the moment of diagnosis I was uncertain it, but it felt very a very risky thing to do it was quite an anxious uh, mm -hmm. time for me um, and um, the moment of revelation, which came on the day of my diagnostic interviews, so I was told in person, um, was just extraordinary. It mm. was like a sort of euphoria that came over me. 
And I had thought that the psychologist might have a problem in that she might say, oh, we don't know, you know, it, it, it's, it's a kind of, um, you know, not, not clear, it, it might not be clear, but it was incredibly clear. And she just used the word definitively. Mm. And so that was sort of almost like permission to go. I remember coming out of the clinic and just thinking, wow, you know, it was, it was like amazing. And <laughs> um, <laughs> a bit like, I mean, the only thing I can compare it to really is childbirth. Um, it felt that powerful. It, it was a revelatory moment and um, it did feel incredibly affirming. And I, yeah, I went home on the train from the Lorna Wing Centre texting all my friends who were, you know, celebrating with me and going, yay, one of us. <laughs> and it was, <laughs> and it was, it was just a fabulous feeling, but I hadn't realised at that point, which is probably where the project, we, we can talk about this um, in a moment, is that I hadn't realised that it was just really the beginning. Mm. It, 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 you know, it, it felt like a really incredible moment in my life. And it is a moment that I like to celebrate now, but um I wasn't sort of aware. I thought that was it. Mm. I wasn't kind of aware that there would be a whole process to go through. Yeah, definitely. And I guess you've done lots of things over the years to try and, you know, understand what's been happening. Um, and this has led you to this neurophototherapy project that you've just had funded. So could you tell us a little bit about the things that have led to its creation and maybe like what exactly it is? <laughs> So it's been a combination of, yes, five, five years of um, exploration of how to be an autistic professional, um, how to work accessibly, and what my work needs to be about. And it's been a bit of a kind of um, sort of roundabout process in a way, which was accelerated by the lockdown. So um, Previous to lockdown, I was really working on more of the post-memory side of my practice in my work, in my creative work, while working a lot on, you know, the area of neuro neurodivergence and access mm -hmm. as a consultant and advocate and mentor. So there was this kind of schism in, in my work and, and I was approaching the idea of wanting to work with neurodivergence in my creative practice. Mm -hmm. But during the lockdown, I couldn't access my studio and I just had my camera and myself and I had begun a little bit of this what I call um, performance photography <laughs> a, ver a very minor strand in my practice and it just yeah. came to the fore because of the lockdown because I just had me and my camera mm -hmm. and I was documenting myself through the lockdown which was very and fun to see <laughs> <laughs> And I, I found it was a way of speaking to the moment and connecting with people. Mm -hmm. And what I found was, I think I was just coming out of myself more as an authentic autistic person. I felt that because I was working now with my body, uh, with my personality, that I could express that through photography mm -hmm. without the usual social awkwardnesses mm -hmm. and that, that, that can happen where I think as an autistic person, I quite often feel like I don't know if I'm going to make a social blunder. I don't mm -hmm. know if I can say something yeah. or it's going to go belly up <laughs> <laughs> and, and people are just going to think, oh, what, you know, that's a missed time or that comment doesn't chime with me. What's she on about? Yeah. Whereas with a, with a photograph, you're kind of saying a lot of stuff without really saying anything specific mm -hmm. and people can respond to it or not. So mm -hmm. it, it felt more freeing in that sense. Um, and so I began to realize that this was a very separate investigation from previous work. Um, and um, probably we want to talk about the influence of Joe Spence a bit later on in more detail, but um, certainly encountering phototherapy as a practice was a bit of a light bulb moment mm. for me in terms of actually writing up the project and conceiving of it but it does also flow from a lot of the um, consultancy work that I do with organizations supporting neurodivergent creatives and all the people that I've mentored mm -hmm. and another research project that I've been involved with as a creative uh, as a film artist filming a project that is about um, co-creating workshops with autistic girls and watching them 
working and, and being creative really fed into this this work as well so it's yeah. it's it the light bulb moment was in encountering phototherapy as an idea understanding what I was doing in my own practice and then applying it in a wider sense to a need that I'd recognized amongst the people who I've encountered mm -hmm. in all the other aspects of my work so this need for a, some recovery after diagnosis yeah. that that moment of recognition is not an end point it's a yeah. it's a beginning and yeah. that there's no support for it there's no recognition of it and no support mm. for it currently yeah and I guess you've you've said that you know it's and I think it's important point to note that this is the first time that you've used um, your neurodivergent diagnosis in your artwork and I know that you said you know part of it was to do with lockdown but why is the moment right right now to be kind of doing this I think it's also a quest for um, empowerment and coherence as a person. So um, the more I come out, the more uh, empowered I feel, the, the more authentic I can be, mm -hmm. the more access I have in the world is what I find, rather than it being, you know, people get, get I think, quite um, rightly, because it is very still very stigmatised, people get very... Um, trapped in stigma mm -hmm. and it's it, it's correct because there are places where you can't talk about being a neurodivergent or autistic person it's that stigma is real the harms are real mm -hmm. um but actually the most important thing for me has been to just counter the stigma um by being very very open and it sounds paradoxical but actually it, it that works for me yeah. it might not work for everybody but yeah. Certainly, I think um, I think for all of for all humans, we need to be as authentic as mm -hmm. we can in our lives to be um, able to, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> thrive rather than just su survive. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think that that that's also probably where I am in my life. I'm a, I'm a you know middle aged person now. I've had a lot of life experience. I've been a bit tired of masking <laughs> <laughs> and and not being able to be myself you yeah. know and I think it's just also maybe that midlife moment that people talk <laughs> about you know where you <laughs> where you start doing crazy things and and you just and, don't uh, care anymore yeah. what, how you come oh, across to other people <laughs> god totally totally I have that kind of yeah I, I can really feel myself morphing into that you know <laughs> person that doesn't doesn't give a damn and yeah yeah totally Totally. But I think it's, you know, you said that you feel at that point now where you're happy to kind of explore and be open with other people. And I think through me spending time looking at your project, it's really nice to see how honest and open you've been. And I really hope that that inspires other people to kind of see what's possible if they do that as well. So thank you. Me for too. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned just then, um, about phototherapy could you maybe briefly say how your neurophototherapy differs from phototherapy because I know you said it was like building on the themes within phototherapy yeah so um phototherapy is is quite an established practice now um and I really only have focused on Joe Spence's mm -hmm. body of work so I can't really talk about it you know yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. as a as a wider phenomena that is a whole area of study and it's very exciting to to start exploring that mm -hmm. I mean it's just incredible um but um I suppose my work differs from Jo Spence's in that her practice uh, evolved from a co-counseling relationship mm -hmm. and she made a lot of her photographs in collaboration with an artist and phototherapist called Rosie Martin mm -hmm. and it was really about um, having a conversation and uh, staging photographs and analysing them together. And um, I feel that for me, it's been very important to have complete control over my own process and that my conversation really is with myself mm -hmm. um, and that my collaborators are my camera, scissors, yeah. paper and glue primarily. Um, my collaborators are also my audiences who comment and respond and I, I absolutely thrive on that and love that um, and that's a really really important part so I feel like I'm I'm working in quite a different way and that for um, 
autistic people, for neurodivergent people, this might be really important. This could be a really good adaptation mm. of the method because although you might want to collaborate, you might even want to do this in workshops and in groups, which I will explore in the next phase of my mm -hmm. project. Um, there's a very good chance that because this is about unmasking and trying to be genuine, mm. that you may need to start with yourself. Yeah. And I have this sense, so my new, a very exciting finding that's come through this research is that I feel that I can now articulate unmasking as quite an intimate process. Mm. And that maybe beginning very personally and intimately, that you can discover things which enable you to be bolder and more authentically yourself yeah. in, in with other people and in other areas of your life. But it's sort of almost got to be something that you know begins with you that's my sense anyway and that yeah. could be the case for people who've quite late diagnosed as we say have possibly been quite isolated and don't have a community of people mm -hmm. around them that they can share ideas with but that this could be a gentle way to yeah to definitely. begin definitely so Sonia, I'm going to attempt my <laughs> bad technology side of things now and attempt to share my screen <laughs> and make it all work very beautifully. So let's just go to full screen. Yay. Hang on, let's go full. This is where it starts to go wrong. Oh, hang on. Stop share. Oh. There we go. Can we see that? Yeah, I can see okay. it. <laughs> so can I, that's, that's good. So we're sharing our screen now and I wanted to start looking at some of the imagery that you've been creating that you've been sharing on your Instagram account and the handle for that is at s underscore b o u e um, and some of these works then feature in a pdf and an online exhibition which we'll discuss a little bit later but I thought we'd talk about some of the things that you're suggesting in the PDF from this research that you've been doing. So I'm particularly fascinated with a couple of things that you've been doing that really bring a smile to my face when I look mm -hmm. at them. So one of them is collaging objects to any surface with old and new photos. And in particular on the screen right now, we can see two building blocks uh, with an older photo and a newer photo of you on it and could you tell us about this process that you've been doing with the building blocks and your old photos? Yeah so um, I had a collection of vintage toy blocks which um, are very powerful for me because when I look at them or when I um, hold them I can almost feel I feel the child in myself um, I, I feel like I'm embodying that child again, or that it's almost like the breath of the child I was is on my neck when I'm, it's, it's a very strange visceral sensation. Mm -hmm. um, and so the fact that these are toy blocks is integral to the process for me, because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to reconnect with myself, um, this very feisty little kid that you see here, Mm -hmm. um, sticking her tongue out at the camera and I think my sister's the photographer mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it, it, you know I'm, I'm sort of trying to reconnect with her because I think she has the knowledge that I need to be who I am I think she she had all the right ideas she knew who she was mm -hmm. um, and the, the the contemporary image is what I made during lockdown and it's actually referencing this photograph. It's sort of like a restaging mm -hmm. of this event, which happened in a in a woods in Paris. Actually, <laughs> this is this is in my god. So it's the the Bois de Boulogne, which now has a, a quite a seedy reputation. But back in the day, <laughs> we we used to we used to walk there as a as a family. Um, and this is you know from the nineteen seventies. Um, and so this is a contemporary image. And what I'm doing is I'm restaging, which is one of Joe Spence's key ideas. Um, and this is before I'd even encountered the work of Joe Spence. Um, and really splicing together these two images. And it's like a physical act of joining, which mm -hmm. feels very powerful. Um, 
and it's like I, I was me I always was me I'm still me I'm still that person mm -hmm. is what I'm saying in this image but I'm doing it in a very very playful joyful mm -hmm. way um, and it does feel very empowering mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it does feel like unmasking actually yeah. to do this um, and it's also about being wild so I had this concept of rewilding myself as well, which didn't quite come through in my arts council application, but maybe <laughs> next time, maybe next time round. <laughs> but, but yeah, this this idea of unlearning and rewilding, mm -hmm. I, I really love, and it fits. Yeah, it I fits love very, that idea. It, it fits very nicely with um, the idea of the concept of neurodiversity, which is really um, inspired by and part of biodiversity. So this mm -hmm. idea that we need all kinds of brains all forms of life in order to survive as and mm. thrive as a, as a as a planet and as a people mm. oh, is it gonna let me click there we go and then I also wanted to include this one because when you posted it onto Instagram it had quite a powerful message with it around kind of hiding as well yeah yeah so I love I love it so the the bottom block is a perspex it's a vintage perspex uh, photograph um, cube mm -hmm. and I've inserted photographs um, that I took during the lockdown with a lampshade which are really were about masking um, you know sort of like this is how I would really like to have a, an instrument like this to go into social situations with. I'd love to have a great big lampshade to put on my head to walk into a party with <laughs> and talk to people through a lampshade and just be as weird as I want to be because I find social situations so bonkers anyway, if I can use that term, sorry. Mm -hmm. I hope that's not a, a, an offensive word for anybody. <laughs> what I mean is it makes, it makes no sense to me. So mm -hmm. I would like to just, um, deconstruct it really um, and you know it's really about introversion and extroversion I guess so um, and then the top cube is I got very obsessed with making these cubes at the very start of my project mm -hmm. um, and that's a paper based cube paper and card the top one and that also has um, photographs from the first lockdown uh, where I was just feeling very dissociated and disorientated and wanting to sort of know how I was supposed to feel and not really, and mm -hmm. feeling sort of almost like I was floating off into space. And I had this pair of tights and it was very intuitive, but quite powerful for me because again, it was a way of sort of denuding, denuding and also covering myself using mm -hmm. my, my face, but you can't really see my face. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's kind of masking and unmasking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're very powerful images. And then the second thing that I really enjoy that you've been doing, um, that again brings a smile to my face, <laughs> <laughs> is um, you saying that you're through this project, you're trying to be more you, but you've yeah. been developing deeper <laughs> with your affinity with birds. So we have a couple of images coming up around yeah. that. And I wondered if you could tell us why this is important. Like this image just brings me <laughs> so much joy of a young image of you looking to the left the photo, and then this huge giant bird next to you kind of looking back at you <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> well um these are these are sort of experiments that happen on the cutting mat when you work with collage and you build up like a repertoire of images which is what i i've come to do over this period of time um you get you get strange juxtapositions and you get happy, a happenstance, which is mm -hmm. lovely. Um, and it, it was actually during the period of time when the ornithology exhibition, which I worked on with um, Madi Acharya Baskerville um, a little while back through the Modern Road studios where I've got my studio. Um, this came out of the back of that ornithology exhibition where I'd sort of collaged myself into bird forms really and, it, <laughs> and this was see sort that of more like clearly <laughs> in that next in the yeah. next <laughs> yeah yeah um and 
it all it's, it's all come about really through the false noses that I've been wearing and feeling that they were like beaks and then feeling very trapped during the lockdown and feeling like I would like some wings and this sort of bird um, identification really developed out of this work and these thoughts but also this deep identification that I feel with birds which I think is about um, again being sort of dissociated a bit from human mm. conversation and sometimes I feel like I'm circling and I'm I'm sort of operating on a different level I sometimes use this metaphor of um, because I see things in an aerial way sometimes mm. like I can I can quite often see how things connect very quickly because I feel I'm swooping over while other people are sort of talking about detail I feel like I'm just sort of circling mm. and able to see things in a different way and I, I just love I think birds are so beautiful and I just love bird song and their very being it seems very um self-contained and mm. and um separate definitely. in a way definitely so, yeah yeah everyone definitely needs to check those out on your Instagram <laughs> and then another element that you've been looking at is kind of a performative side which you said has been coming out more and more through the lockdown and I know yeah. you've commissioned some older pieces of clothing that you had when you were younger and had them so that you could wear them now yes 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 <laughs> <laughs> so we can see so, kind of part of one on the screen now that's got a rather yeah. large blue color <laughs> <laughs> so this this was um, part of the project which I hadn't planned, which has come out of contingency funding. And I'm so pleased that I built the contingency fund into the, I do that for all my projects because I suddenly realized that I needed some costumes mm -hmm. and I wanted to work with um, somebody called Anne Tut who's made pajamas for me in the past for a, um, a, a MIMA um, exhibition called Thresholds, which mm -hmm. uh, Aidan Mosby curated, and I was lucky to be one of the commissioned artists for. And so I decided to contact Anne again and ask her to make some costumes for me on the basis of some old photographs. And this um, dress which she's created is actually, we couldn't find a suitable fabric. And then I remembered that I had the curtain fabric still from my childhood bedroom. <laughs> Excellent. which <laughs> <laughs> which displays my wonderful mum's uh taste which which was very I mean my mum has just so inspired me um growing up in the houses that she's furnished because she had such extraordinary kind of joyful um color choices and you know fabrics that she 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 really enjoyed all these hot colors together mm -hmm. um and yeah, this was th these were the curtains that I, I I dreamt next to. So when I was sort of thinking about going back in time and reconnecting, it suddenly made perfect sense to use this fabric. And the dress is based on a pattern of a dress that my mother made for me when I was about eleven, um, which is very faded in the photograph. So Anne's had to kind of really use her imagination to work this <laughs> one up. Um, and and I haven't quite used them in the way that I thought that I would, which is really interesting. And I think, again, the lockdowns is part of this. But also, for me, um, it's been important to splice together a lot of the different elements of the work. Mm. So it hasn't been as full on performative. They've been more collaged into works. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's been quite interesting as well. Um, and it was very challenging. I mean, Anne did a brilliant job. It was very challenging. We couldn't do really any fittings. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so it, it, you know, it's, it, and I think what is important for me really is that all of this really is a leap of imagination and it's the imagination that counts. So the precision doesn't really matter that much. It's mm. more about reaching into this sense of embodiment and these visceral kind of feelings of connection that I want to recreate. Mm, definitely. So you mentioned um, that you've, throughout this project, you've been working at your own pace and just seeing what emerges and kind of seeing, at, you know, how that makes you feel and, and the emotions that come out of that. And um, I love that you use the term breadcrumbing. 
to kind of explain that and that you've put no pressure on yourself to overshare anything. But I also like that you've been saying that you're revealing yourself to yourself throughout this whole body of work that you've been creating through this research phase. And I wondered why this was important for you to do this now. Well, I think because um, as an autistic person, although I'm very literate emotionally because I've done a lot of training, I've trained as an art therapist and I've also um, just recently remembered that I did a, a, um, a British Association of Psychotherapists two year counselling diploma as well. So I've, I've worked really hard at emotional literacy, but I still am coming to terms with the fact that I quite often feel very disconnected from myself. Mm. And although I've done a huge amount of work in the last five years in unpicking and understanding loads of elements of my um, diagnosis, I still feel like I'm uncovering and needing to uncover and unpick so the levels of this just keep yeah go it's like an ever-evolving process <laughs> you feel like you've got there and then you think oh or, or a challenge comes along in your life and you can't manage it and you think but I, I thought I'd done yeah. this work and it's not and I think that is also very in common with all humans where we're all we're all constantly evolving aren't we yeah um and I think but I but I think it's the revealing yourself to yourself that's the key to this method so thank you for highlighting that because um one of the very important elements and I'm really pleased we've got the mirror image to talk about this (laughs) is that because I trained as an art therapist, because I understand that the objects we make can be mirrors for us. So they can reflect us back to ourselves. Mm. The objects made within art therapy are considered to be these you know, mirrors to the self and you, you, you gain more insight as you work with the therapist on those images and you, t- you look back at them and you, you talk them through. Um, and I think this work is sort of like a conversation with the self where you reflect yourself back to yourself. And that's very powerful because a lot of the information that we pick up about ourselves, if we're not diagnosed and if we're in a, there's still so much societal ignorance that we're not getting accurate reflections back. We're not getting useful feedback from the world. Mm. And so this breaks that, this work breaks that loop and you start to get the kind of information about yourself that you really need. Like, I'll give you an ex- a really, an example that totally floored me, was I don't think I'd realised how old I was. Until <laughs> I did I started really looking at myself in my images and editing my own images and just thinking, well, wow, I, I haven't quite grasped that. There's no way that um, with all my sensory and spatial challenges, there's no way that I could pick up that information without these photographs. I, if I look in the mirror, my, my eyes don't quite focus long mm-hmm. enough because of all the movement and the reflections. Uh, this is to do with my part of my neurological condition, which does affect my, my focus. Mm. And so I think it's that's the bit of the project. Well, one of the bits of the project that I'm really excited about, this idea that we can actually provide really useful feedback loops for ourselves mm. in making these works. Definitely. But also, if you think you look younger than you actually are, that's a great thing, Sonia. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. <laughs> we all need a bit of that. But I think, like you said, I think it's all throughout our lives I think it's great for us to always be learning about ourselves and our practice and stuff through what we're doing and I think that's a kind of essential really definitely so we touched a bit on Joe Spence earlier but I thought we'd quickly share a Joe Spence image alongside one of your images that kind of was inspired um, and took an idea from Joe so Joe Spence for anyone that doesn't know was a British photographer is a British was a British photographer? Was, was, yeah. Thought I've written was, and then I doubted myself. (laughs) (laughs) Was a British photographer, a writer, a cultural worker, and a phototherapist. So, Sonia, tell us about these two images. Well, you say there that I took the 
inspiration from Joe Spence for this image, but actually I didn't. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason I put these two images together was that this was the Eureka moment. So I made the image of myself sucking on a dummy during the first lockdown. And it was really an unmasking moment. It was trying to speak to this idea of needing emotional comfort uh, and regression, regression, this idea of going back to childhood for myself mm -hmm. as, a, uh, you know, as part of my autistic unmasking. Um, and I subsequently saw this image okay. of Joe Spence in the Richard, I can't pronounce it, is it Saltoon? Saltoon, Sol yeah. Saltoon, oh great, I have been pronouncing it right, the Richard Saltoon gallery That's exhibition. That's how I pronounce it, <laughs> whether it's right or not. I well, I think we're... <laughs> We'll call it that. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I saw this image as part of a knockout. Fabulous. I do believe, unless I'm wrong, it's, it's on until online. October. It's yeah. on until October. I urge everybody to look at it. It's knockout. And it was when I saw this image and also one with the teddy bears. I'd taken a picture of myself with a teddy bear as well. But I just suddenly realised that this practice, there was this overlap. And that what I was doing was phototherapy as well. Mm -hmm. And I just had totally geeked out on Joe Spence, saw everything she'd done, watched all this. Um, I think it's an arena program that she did mm -hmm. um, all around her phototherapy practice. And that was, that was when the project was born, really, was just seeing this image um, right. and realizing that I was just doing something so similar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So we don't really have much time to talk about origin story, but we're going to pop a link in the chat box for everyone to see it, Sonia. And um, it's on your website. It's an online exhibition that uh, is featured as a PDF, as a series of images and as, as audio translations. And it shares some key life experiences from, from you. So we'll drop that in for people to explore at a later date. But I thought we'd talk a little bit more about the PDF guide that you'll release soon that you've created from your research that will be used as kind of a self-help roadmap at any pace, at any time for anyone that feels that they want to use it and they can dip in and out of it and all those sorts of things. And also it's great that you said that it can be used by everyone from sort of amateur creatives to professional creatives and everyone in between. And so I wondered what your hopes were for this PDF that you're going to be kind of releasing um, and how you'd like people to use it. Well, it's still very much a work in progress. So my concept, my, my um, proposal to Arts Council England was to create a model for people to be able to, for neurodivergent creatives to be able to use at no matter what level, as you say. Um, and the PDF as it stands is um, going to be taken to a fo focus group, I'm really glad to say. Mm -hmm. It's also going to be trialled in a very small closed group um, by two of the people who will be writing for me and mm -hmm. I'll write about that experience. Um, and then I'm also going to be sharing it in a series of interviews with um, or conversations really with neurodivergent creatives because I want to get some I want it to be mm -hmm. seen through lots of eyes before I actually release it mm -hmm. um, so it's it's got to go through quite a process I think mm -hmm. and so I think I'll know more how it could be used mm -hmm. um, by the close of that process but my hope for it is that it will give encouragement and inspiration for people to have a go and try it mm -hmm. um, and you know there's lots of ideas in there and actually what what I loved about making the pdf um, such a joyful thing to do although it was yeah. I, I did find the writing quite quite challenging because I had to think about possible audiences and um, really try to be very clear in in, in how I express quite complex ideas. Mm -hmm. So that, that was quite challenging. But um, yeah, I, I kind of hope that it will also be just, it could just be something that you read and feel good about. 
-hmm. you might not even have to do any of it but I think it's something that could be read and just enjoyed as well so Mm -hmm. I think there's lots of levels you can you can engage with it and I hoped for that with the um with the Instagram account as well that people could you know dip in and out of that and take what they wanted from it and read the backstory if they wanted to or not and you know and the backstory is in your stories section of Instagram, isn't it? So if yeah. you wanted to catch up on that from the beginning yeah. of your project, they can go back in and click into that. Yeah. Definitely. I just loved this image, so I've just put it in there. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you want to briefly say what this image is? <laughs> well, it's one, it's one of a series of images where I started splicing my face together and it was so powerful for me. And I just absolutely love, I love this work. I, I love this image too. And this is so a school photo. Oh, how old was I? Probably, I don't know, 12. 13 with very plucked eyebrows and you know <laughs> my Farrah Fawcett flick which always used to go crinkly because I had such curly hair <laughs> and um, I just spent hours blow drying and tonging it and it just used to just by the end of the day it'd be a frizz <laughs> and uh, and I just it was again one of these I, I cut up a lot of faces and then I started playing with them and it was one of these happy coincidences where some of the features I I never bothered about thinking of scale ahead of Mm -hmm. time but some of the features just sort of happened to really match up Mm. and this idea that um the gaze is the same really Mm. but here I but 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 the um the image of me as an older person is I think from the lockdown, from the first lockdown, yes it is, it's very early on in the first lockdown and I'm wearing a pair of glasses that are my mum's glasses they're not my glasses I <laughs> can't see anything <laughs> through them um, <laughs> but I just it's kind of like the beginning of the process this feels to me like the beginning of the process and having the camera in the picture really matters to me because at that point I wasn't even using the timer on my camera mm-hmm. I was still using a mirror to take pictures which is how I started I started with the mirror and taking photos mm-hmm. and it's just that kind of um yeah, that, that very, very beginning. And I just like the, I like the, the stare as well. I like that facial expression. It feels quite mm-hmm. powerful. It feels quite sort of like a bit challenging in a way or a bit like, yeah. kind of like, um, don't mess with me, which is what I was like as a teenager, <laughs> really. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Before we move on to the last picture, I also just wanted to make a brief point about your PDF that when people um, find it, I think it's really refreshing that throughout it, um, you kind of make these uh, statements and ideas of things that people can do, but then you always add in addition saying, but also, you know, you don't have to do it in that way because you don't want people to think that that way is gospel and that way is the only way that's valid. You're kind of saying you could do it like this, but you could also do it in your own way or in your, that makes you feel more comfortable or something. And I just, mm. I wanted to point that out because I think it's really important and really refreshing that you've included that throughout all of this work and this body of work that you've created, that it can be interpreted in any, any way, shape or form and that no way is the right way. Um, which leads us on to our final photo, which I thought was a really lovely photo um, to end on. And this kind of brooch within the photo seems very important to you and you call it a self-taught keepsake. And I wondered if you could tell us about the importance of this and and maybe other people might like to do the same thing after hearing from you. So, so yes, this, this is um, a very simple little uh, object which I made from a found a found brooch because I got the brooch in a charity shop and it didn't have a, an image in it and I had it for ages it was just knocking around in you know with all the, the stuff that I keep for making and then I I, I got this um, dictionary which had this extraordinary page in it with these very antiquated terms for <laughs> various forms of the word abnormal <laughs> Um, And I just loved abnormous and, um, you know, abnormity and and just words that are not really. And then I also loved the way that it was sort of um, 
next to Ab Abnegator and a board and a boat and all these sort of, but it just feels very random because it's been ordered in a, you know, in a way that's not really logical to me. It doesn't make any sense to me as a dyslexic person, but um, it's more that this having made it feels like um, I'm owning the words, I'm owning the terminology that might, have been, might be used for somebody like me, that I'm abnormal, I, I'm atypical, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, and it just feels very powerful to wear it almost as a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. And it's part of a practice that I use of self-talk, which I'm very proud of. So I do talk to myself. Mm -hmm. I know it's, you know, it's a, a conventionally thought to be, a colloquially thought to be a sign of madness. It <laughs> sure isn't. It's a sign of, it's a sign of um, mental health self-care. Um, <laughs> and um, so I, I talk to myself because as an autistic person growing up not knowing you're autistic, you can pick up such negative internal dialogues about yourself that it, fe it feels very important to me to be able to talk that down and reinforce for yourself the positive identification that you need to be able to manage your life. And um, just love wearing it because and I, I wear it very selectively. So I've worn it to autism conferences and it's been absolutely, you know, kind of um, dived on and loved and shared mm. in blogs and all sorts. And then I've worn it in neurotypical spaces and it goes completely unremarked. And I find that yeah. very fascinating. <laughs> and, I, and I sort of think that it is almost like a covert form of signaling and unmasking and it makes me feel very powerful. And if I'm going somewhere where I feel a bit kind of intimidated, I might think of putting it on to mm -hmm. strengthen my, my, my sense of myself as I'm walking out and about in the world. Definitely, definitely. Well, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and it's just back to me and you. <laughs> and I just, uh, it, this is the end of our talk now and now we'll have some uh, live question and answers that we'll be going to shortly but I just wanted to say thank you to you Sonia for allowing me to delve into your practice so deeply and and learn so much more about you and your history and um, everything that makes you you and it's been really inspirational for me and I think I was explaining to you earlier it's left me wanting to do so much more <laughs> research into things now so I just wanted to say thank you um, Oh, thank well, thank you. Thank you. You've been absolutely amazing. It's lovely to have your careful and um, enthusiastic eye looking at my work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you to everyone listening. And we'll see you shortly for questions and answers with Sonia. Hi everyone and welcome to the live Q&A part of today's talk. We've been having some questions coming in and keep popping them in the chat if you want to ask any. I thought I'd start with a question from Karen Sonia. How do you move from revealing yourself to yourself to revealing yourself to others? Because Karen believes that she couldn't ever imagine being comfortable or confident enough to share this deeply and vulnerably with others. Yes, it is. It is quite a process. Um, I think it takes time. Um, so I wouldn't rush that or, or, or push yourself to do it. Um, I think it's a very gradual thing and unfortunately trial and error. So mm -hmm. I've, I've, when I first had my diagnosis, I would quite often put myself in situations where I felt I had to be very open mm -hmm. about it without realising that it actually wasn't a good moment or... Yeah. <laughs> You know, it just just wasn't appropriate. Not the right or time. Not, <laughs> not, not the right time. Um, and I think it's something that you develop with practice, which is why I'm so keen to develop this idea that I've um, managed to to pull together with neurophototherapy and to share it and and to see if it's something that um, 
in the project guide, I've described it a bit like um, being a test center with no cars and that learning to unmask is a bit like learning to drive a car. So it's something that can feel very bumpy and <laughs> difficult to begin with. You have kangaroo jumps and, and all of that. And then, and then it sort of gradually becomes smoother and you begin to learn as well that a lot of the time you don't need to unmask. Mm. A lot of the time this can be a knowledge that you can hold within yourself uh, because you feel secure enough in yourself because you've done the unmasking to yourself. You've revealed yourself to yourself. You feel more self-confident. Mm. You actually understand a bit more when and when not to reveal and which bits to reveal. So mm. I think it is, it's, it, it's about the fact that we just haven't had the practice yeah, and that it does take time. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah. And on that, Colin's just asked, is unmasking an important element within your practice? Yes, very much so. <laughs> very much so. And it, and it kind of it's interesting because it began very much with the advocacy side of what I was doing. So I came straight out of the tracks with my autism diagnosis as a professional person who was blogging and, you know, advocating. Mm. And I was sort of very, you know, some of those early blogs are very raw and yeah. very open. Um, and I think they were very powerful for that reason. And that was something that I was able to do alongside some other women that were discovering their autism at the same time. Um, but it's the doing it with your work that feels very different. And I think that will be key for me going forward now with my mm. practice, mm. that it will be vital for me and that it's a bit like understanding where you are within the sector as well, which can be really complicated with uh, disability anyway. But when it's a kind of a neurodivergence, you've got that extra layer, um, as you do with any invisible disability, of actually being able to pass. Yeah. But that what that what that's about, what that does to you as a person, is actually. For me, anyway, it, it sort of it's it's very painful and fragmenting. So I would rather not pass. Mm, <laughs> I would rather be way of yeah, at it, yeah, it. yeah, yeah. I think I think there are parallels with other other minority groups mm. that feel that that's part of their culture too. So for me, really, it's about being authentic to myself, and mm. then I know where I am, and I feel. I feel more confident. I feel yeah, more, but but I, but I'm very aware as well that I have to mask, and there are times. So I put that in my PDF guide as well that there are times when you can't unmask. Yeah, and it's not safe to, or it's just not. As we were saying, it's just not the right yeah, space definitely. and time. Yeah. Definitely, and your PDF guide will be out soon through your yes. website hopefully it will be out by the end of the project which is September it still has to go through a process but yes, yeah definitely yeah. so Joanne um who said she's also autistic has asked how do you pace yourself day to day this again is something that I feel that five years on I'm getting better at that um and I'm, I'm really so careful now with um not trying not to program too many zooms into a day for example or too many activities I've sort of become far more aware of the things which are draining mm. for me and the things which are actually enabling and and give me more energy so it's kind of about trying to work that out and I think I'm just very lucky that I can do that I'm in a position mm. where I can do that and I understand that's not the case for everybody and it can be very hard so finding those things which really help you to decompress as we call it decompressing mm -hmm. from overload which is what happens to us when we can't pace ourselves yeah um, as as we need to so it really is about um practice again and unfortunately overload unfortunately yeah. there are still days that I can't I can't control every day of the year uh, yeah. and I can't control every experience and to give you an example so yesterday I went to Bristol for the first time on a train since the first lockdown. And I hadn't calculated everything in my day. And so I encountered things which were almost overwhelming. And I had those sort of flashback moments to when I was first diagnosed, being in situations where I just felt I'm about to lose it or I'm, I'm gonna be out of my depth here. Um, and it's just things like um, taking a moment 
and uh, I was at this point of like almost having a migraine and mm. and, and a sort of really really difficult moment for me where I was in this unfamiliar place I couldn't find anywhere to to rest or have a drink mm. and I thought oh I'm just going to try and go home on the train but I ended up going to a cafe and meeting a friend instead and it was just that 40 minutes of sitting in the ca- really quiet cafe having a coffee yeah. that just enabled me to just and I would have pressed on so the the, the kind of you know the, the autistic part of me that wants to just get home and get on yeah. would have pressed on but then I learned on that day it was much better actually to take a break yeah and definitely. have a little bit of social time with another autistic friend yeah. and like and you said great. before that's just through your experience and through you know you've had those bad days and you've pushed through and kind of you know it's not been the best thing for you so it's just no, experience no. That allowed you to realize that and I think I think the recovery time takes less as you get more used to balancing out your days in a more global sense if that makes sense so I think if you have lots of days all crammed together which are overloading then it just can feel like you're never going to get through that you're mm-hmm. never going to be able to decompress quickly yeah. but if you're actually creating more space generally for yourself over time then when it does go a bit wonky it doesn't take you so long to, yeah, to come definitely. back from that definitely um there's another question that says, um, when you look around now, what and who is missing from the arts in terms of neurodivergency and what would you like to see more of? And this was directed at us both. So I was just going to throw in my two, two pence as it is and just say that um, we're really excited that Project Artworks is up for the Turner Prize uh, this year and having this neurodivergent artists and their collective um, as a whole, up for something like that. It's going to be really interesting to see how audiences react to that, how critics, how other galleries and things react to having some of this work as part of this larger prize, as part of a larger exhibition that's going to be um, in Coventry from October later this year. So I thought I'd just add that in. But Sonia, what would you say? Um, I say that um, artists who are openly autistic are missing from the conversation in what I would call mainstream arts, regrettably, I don't like that term. Um, and I also think that um, there is a lack of critique and writing mm-hmm. and understanding of neurodivergent practice. I feel this is something that's in its infancy in terms of the sector, that's something that's really bubbling up through the grassroots. Um, and there's a lot of neurodivergent practice in the arts, which is unrecognized as well. Mm-hmm. But, you know, people people who do manage to get through the system, people who do uh, get opportunities and make work, but it's not acknowledged that is neurodivergent practice. Mm-hmm. So I think we've got lo- there's lots of things missing. There's lots of areas that need development. Um, and I think also um, just this thing that it is still very stigmatizing and we have to understand mm-hmm. that. You know, we really have to understand the very real pressures. And I know neurodivergent artists who are happy to say they're neurodivergent, but will not say they're autistic. Mm. That's and I think that's a, that's a real problem, yeah. Well, someone's asked a question around <laughs> that, actually. Um, Nicola has said, uh, what advice would you give to a younger autistic woman who's at the early stages in their creative career, but who's concerned about whether or not to identify as autistic? Ooh, that's a very personal call. Um, And I know young women, I've mentored young women in this situation, and I think it has to feel right and comfortable for you um, and not to feel pressured to expose yourself Mm -hmm. in situations where you don't feel comfortable. Um, It really depends on where you are in your diagnosis, I think, because my advice to lots of people when they're newly diagnosed is to spend a year getting to know yourself feeling comfortable finding community um, and then think how you may want to use it in your practice there are some people who are just straight off the blocks you know I'm really excited by a young cohort of neurodivergent people who are coming through really confidently and already using it in their practice Mm -hmm. and that's very very exciting Mm -hmm. Um, but I think if it's something that's sort of a later diagnosis that you're feeling your way uh, maybe use the term neurodivergent 
first and I'm uh, I'm kind of like you know reinforcing the stigma in a way very unfortunately um, but you do have to look after yourself and um, just put feelers out because I think now as well the arts are changing quite rapidly and there are a lot of people out there who are now starting to be a bit more familiar with this it's just that they may not understand your practice they may have now have heard of neurodivergence they may now be feeling like it's something that they want to support mm. or get to know but they may very well not understand the practice side so yeah it's about it's about gently does it I think I think that's important and like you said whether Mm. when you feel comfortable like not forcing it upon yourself like little steps trialing it here or trialing it around people that you feel more comfortable and in a safe space and seeing how that makes you feel and then taking it further yeah I think trying to find other artists trying to find other neurodivergent artists and trying to form supportive networks and communities is really helpful really helpful um joe asked uh, earlier about when you were posting all of your um pictures and your story and everything onto instagram you were kind of asking audiences to get in touch with you and anyone that felt re- you know they were in similar situations and stuff so he was keen to hear more about any specific audience responses that you've had to this neurophototherapy work that you've been doing yeah so i've had i've had a lot of people contact me um, and it was quite overwhelming, actually. <laughs> and I had to stop putting call to actions, unfortunately, because I couldn't respond to everybody personally, which is what I really like to do. So I was able to respond to most people who contacted me. Um, and the overwhelming thing really is the number of mm-hmm. late diagnosed neurodivergent people in the arts is extraordinary. Mm-hmm. Um And then the other thing to say is, which made me feel very sad, is, yeah, this leap where the feedback was, what you're doing is extraordinary. I I can't see myself doing that. Mm. And that's the bit I feel sad is that it should that it should be extraordinary. Why? Why? Why can't we do? You know, why Mm -hmm. can't we reveal ourselves? Why can't we do this work? Why does it have to feel brave? Mm -hmm. Why can't it just be? Why can't it just be? And yeah. it's that thing that, that that really struck me as um, understanding just how very difficult it is. And I, I put myself back to thinking about myself in my twenties, and I, I expect I would have felt very similarly. I think it's it, I think it's hard as a younger person if you haven't had that, you know, understanding about yourself, and you're at a point where you're just starting out in your career, and it, it can feel very overwhelming. I think. Mm. Definitely. But there is support out there and there's loads of us. Yeah. There's loads of us. <laughs> so true. So true. I've realised that we've come to the end of our time, but I wanted to squeeze one last question in. And also just to say that um, Disability Arts Online are going to pop a quick survey in the chat box. So if people have a few minutes to spend doing that, that would be really super. But there's a question come from Magical Woman women sorry not woman um I've never passed as a neurotypical person and been open about being autistic I've been very belittled and people appear scared or angry of me so how would you say to steer the conversation when you sense fear in other people this is interesting isn't it um Mm. I've had that experience too where people look like a rabbit in the headlamps and they don't know what to do I've had I've had the classics as well of people saying, "Oh, but you don't look autistic," or "Oh, mm-hmm. but you're so empathic," or "Oh, uh, oh, oh no, but you're not. You know, you, you're not really autistic. <laughs> not like the, not like the people who you know who, who they imagine mm-hmm. to be truly autistic." Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a tricky one. And I think if people feel afraid, then um, that's kind of their problem. Mm. I, I've, I've really, I really sort of decided not to take responsibility for other people, and that may sound not helpful. Sorry, magical women, if that's not a helpful answer. But I really don't take. I think we can just get exhausted by trying to look after other people, and why should we? Mm. Why should we do that? And if they can't meet you halfway, then they're not people to be involved with. Mm, that's true. I'm sorry I'm very very firm on that point yeah. it's good it's good to have that Sonia <laughs> um, 
Um, well, that draws to a close uh, our event today. I just want to say thanks, Sonia, for um, letting me chat with you. And thanks to Disability Arts Online for hosting this event. And possibly most importantly, thanks for Arts Council England for funding you to do this neurophototherapy project and for everything that it's done to help you come to terms with um, your neurodivergency as well. Is there any final thoughts that you'd like to say, Sonia? Oh, I'd like to thank you, Jennifer, for looking so carefully at the work and for um, just curating this talk beautifully. Thank you. No problem. And um, I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon and thank you for joining us today.